Hi everyone, and thanks for joining us today. My name is Lee Owen Bowen, and I work on the education programs team here at code.org. I have an awesome job because I get to talk to so many interesting people about the incredible work that they do. Today, I get to talk to two scientists who are using computer science to explore the universe. Dr. Kimberly Arcand and Dr. Ruth Barnard Das both work at the Center for Astrophysics at Harvard and Smithsonian. Dr. Arkin also works on NASA's Chandra X-ray Observatory, and Dr. Das works on NASA's Universe of Learning and the Chandra X-ray Observatory as well. Hi, Kim and Ruta. Hi. So our first question, and it's a very serious one, what's your favorite space-focused movie or book? Ruta, let's start with you. Uh, very serious, of course. <laughs> um, I have recently completely fallen in love with Marvel. Um, you know, Guardians of the Galaxy is wonderful, uh, particularly anything Avengers related. Um, that's a recent love. Um, way back from my childhood, I'd have to say the Magic School Bus space-based episodes, Lost in Space, Seas Stars. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Um, I love this question. And I don't know, I know I had more time than Rutu to think, but um, I, I have to say Contact. I absolutely loved that movie because it came out when I was essentially deciding that I wanted to be a scientist and seeing the main character in that role was just really exciting for me. I hadn't seen that many women scientists before that. So yeah, that movie was, was super important. Ah, thanks for sharing. I love the Magic School Bus as well. That's still one of my favorite shows. So <laughs> thank you all for sharing that. Um, okay, so tell us about your work. Tell us about what you do and how does your work help your community? Kim, you want to start? Sure. I'm actually going to share some slides really quick. Here we go. Okay, so hopefully everybody can see. Um, I just thought it would be useful to talk a little bit about my path because I really, I did not know what I wanted to be when I was young. And I think that's totally normal. I wanted to save the world. I wanted to be a doctor. I wanted to be an environmentalist. I wanted to be a veterinarian. I love the idea of science, but I also loved writing and I loved reading and I loved just hanging out in the woods. So I didn't know what I would do, but I went to school for biology essentially and spent a lot of time looking through a microscope before I realized that I did not want to do that for the rest of my life. So I wandered down to my computer science department and they very kindly adopted me, even though I was not in a computer science program in college. And I think it was that connection of figuring out how to use computers to tell the story of science where I really found my true love. And so I traded a telescope for some coding and then, well, I traded a microscope for some coding and then telescope. And that's what I get to do these days. So um, Rutu and I, we get to spend a lot of time looking at data from NASA's Chandra X Observatory, which is a school bus sized telescope that goes about a third of the way to the moon to essentially observe the high energy universe. Things like exploding stars, things like black holes, and things like colliding galaxies. So that means that we have lots of really amazing information to be able to share with people such as all of you today. And one of my very favorite things that I get to do is to take that information and turn it into something. So turn it into an image, for example, or turn it into something like a 3D print. So one of the ways that I like to think about how I give back to my community, even though I don't kid myself that I'm saving the world these days, 
I do like to spend a lot of time making sure other people have access to the universe like I do. And that includes figuring out how to take such visual data, things that we can see, and turn it into something that we can also touch. So by 3D printing these 3D models of things like exploded stars, for example, I try to make sure that it's not just people with sight that can enjoy this information of our universe, but also people who are blind or low vision to make sure they have access as well. So that's kind of what I get to do. I'll stop sharing. Wow, that those look beautiful. It's like artwork, <laughs> major <laughs> artwork. Thank you for sharing. Ruta? Thank you. Yeah, they're definitely, I'm using them as artwork behind me. Yeah. <laughs> so clearly they're they're very beautiful um, and wonderful to hold. Uh, so I will also share my screen. And let's see. All right, does that seem to work properly? Good to go. Cool, okay. So, hi everyone, I'm Rutu Das. And well, like Kim, I also did not think I would be doing exactly what I'm doing today. Um, I, well, I always loved science and math and I always loved the skies, but I also loved literature and writing and I, wanted to be a poet, wanted to be a writer. And my dad was like, maybe you should do something where you like, you know, have a guaranteed source of income. And I was, at that point I was like, okay, fine. Um, and now I'm like, well, I can do both. But anyway, so I, 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 I loved all the humanities. Um, I continued doing physics because while I loved all the sciences, I was too squeamish to um, do bio. I, I, I can't dissect. Um, I thought I loved chemistry and then found I didn't understand much of chemistry once I actually started learning it. Uh, I was very confused about chemistry, but I still like physics. I loved the universe. Um, and I, through my life, I continued doing both science and things like you know, taking writing classes and philosophy classes and photography classes and things like that. Um, then I went to grad school and did a lot of research and jumped right into astronomy and research and science and did not have a humanities component in my life and decided that I didn't like that very much. So now I am back to both and I I'm an astrophysicist and science communicator, and I use code to do both parts. And I'm gonna show you something really quickly about what I do. So, so as I said, I'm an astrophysicist as part of what I do. Um, and people wonder what that is. I, I hope many of you have seen this sort of meme. You know, uh, many people ask, hey, can you like, read the stars and tell me what's going to happen. Like, no, we can't. We don't do astrology. Um, we can look at the stars and tell you where they'll be the next day, but not what they're, the, the, not any sort of effect they would have on your life. Um, my friends think I do a lot of math. I do some math, but like, I, I, I like math. I don't absolutely love math. So I leave the most math to like the theorists. Um, my mom, well, actually, my mom sort of knows what I do very well, which makes me very happy. But most of my family thinks I'm doing, I'm, you know, creating rockets, working with NASA, sending things into space. I think I am just flying through space and everything is beautiful. There are galaxies, you know, like all those pretty pictures you see in the Marvel movies. Yeah. Um, what I'm actually doing all day is writing lots and lots and lots of code. Because when we look up at the sky, there is so much data. There are so many different points that it's impossible to try to learn about all of that by hand. If I try to like take notes about everything in space by hand, um, well, I, I, I'd, I'd maybe like be able to do like a tiny patch of what I can see with my eyes like over my life, but I, I, I wanna study the whole sky. So, for example, I like to look at clusters of galaxies. Basically, they're a 
bunch of galaxies that are orbiting each other. They're flying around each other. They are some of the biggest things in the universe. In this picture, everything you see, almost every dot you see in this picture, almost every dot is a galaxy. Um, and I want to learn details about all of those galaxies, not just the big ones in the middle, but also the tiny, tiny ones in the background. So as you can see, there are hundreds, maybe thousands of little dots in this picture. So yeah, I'm not going to sit there and do that by hand. I am going to tell a computer how to look at this picture of the sky and tell me about what those little dots are doing. And now it's not just like the thousands on this picture, because then I work with like hundreds of different clusters of galaxies. Um, and there are people who work with thousands of different clusters of galaxies. So you can see like the numbers of little dots add up really, really quickly. And you know, sometimes they're like gritting down at you mischievously going, yeah, I have lots of data. How are you gonna, how are you gonna process it? How are you gonna like make any sense out of me? Um, and I say, well, I'm gonna use code. I'm going to tell a computer how to take each of those little dots and make sense of it for me. Um, one of the other things I can do is make a model of what our universe might be doing. So for a long time, many people thought that the universe was just gravity. You know, gravity is a thing like I throw this thing up, it brings it down to me. It's pulling everything in the universe to each other. So if we put a lot of stuff in one place, everything pulls everything else with gravity. So somebody put a lot of stuff into a box and said, what would happen if we just let gravity take over? And we saw that all that stuff just bunched up. And this is sort of how all the stuff in the universe bunched up into galaxies. So all the little clumps you see there are actually galaxies. And I get to tell a computer to show, like, I get to give a computer instructions on how to show us how the universe turned into galaxies, um, or, you know, how stuff in the universe turned into galaxies. So, as I said, I'm an astrophysicist and science communicator, which means I also get to talk to all of you. Um, and I spend my days and sometimes nights looking at the sky and the stars, writing code, but also creating things for museum displays and writing stories about how we learned about space and creating fun activities. And as I said, talking to all of you and I use coding for that as well. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more later about some of the things I do with that now. Thank you both so much. Jess, I'm amazed just from your introductory question answers. I can only wish we had, I had more time to talk to you all, all day to listen to the amazing work that you all are doing. Um, we have our first audience question and everyone watching, if you have questions, please feel free to leave them in the chat. This question comes from Mrs. Bilka's class. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, how do you decide what colors to use to make those models that you all both showed us? Oh, that is a great question. And we essentially tell these stories by using that science information. So when we get the scientific data from our telescope, scientists will process it and analyze it to figure out what's happening. All of that sciencey goodness that's inside those ones and zeros, that binary code that arrives in our suitcase, if you will, the digital suitcase when we first get the information. And all of the unpackaging of that information and analysis, figuring out what's happening, then drives that scientific story. So we take that scientific story and we figure out how best to then portray that information because all of this information I'm talking about, like the image behind me, for example, this is mostly invisible to human eyes, right? So we have to translate it from one form into another. So we pick a color and we pick other kinds of processes as well based on that science story. And for x-ray images, it often turns out that the best way to show that x-ray data is in like blues and purples and pinks. Um, I'm not exactly sure why, but for some reason that seems to be 
the color palette, if you will, that best suits that data because we often package that information with other kinds of light, with the visible light that we can see with human eyes, for example, or with ultraviolet light or infrared light. And so having different kinds of color codings, it's just like having a weather map, right? On your phone or on the nightly news. And on the weather map, they might have your region color coded by say temperature or by wind speeds. And so we'll do the same thing. We'll color code our data by say the uh, energetic material or by the chemical composition, all of those little bits and pieces that make up that stuff. And so it's all about getting the best map that tells the best parts of those stories to be able to share them with everybody. So yeah, these images, they're, they're not space selfies. They are a translation of scientific information from a form that we can't naturally see with human eyes into something that we can either see or touch or perhaps even hear. Love that space selfies. I, I definitely heard that from <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Is there anything that you wanted to add? Uh, no, I think Kim covered that very completely. <laughs> Perfect. Thank Maybe two completely. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, that's great. <laughs> but just pick ones that look nice. Yeah. <laughs> I'm very passionate about that topic. <laughs> I love it. Okay. So our next question is a two-parter. And the second part of that question comes from an audience question. So if some of the kids watching wanted to do what you all do when they grow up, what are some skills or abilities that they can start working on now? And the second part of that question is, what were the biggest obstacles that you all had to deal with in pursuit of your current careers? Ruta, you wanna start? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, well, if you want to do astrophysics um, or any type of science, really, I would say, first of all, just keep exploring things you're interested in. Um, you never know what will spark out to you. Um, math is important, but like I said, it's not the end all be all. Um, it'll be good to, you know, put, like learn in your math classes and your science classes. Um, if you want to learn how to code um, even a little bit, that will carry through very well um, towards the end. Um, and it's never too late. Like I actually learned to code pretty late in life, um, but it's it's never too late. Um, if, you, if you get a head start, that's wonderful. Um, and what other, well, and if you wanna communicate science like both Kim and I do, well, then you will need to uh, work on your communication skills a bit, um, you know. Don't, don't feel like you need to focus on any one thing to the exception of all others, you know. you. You can do all the things you're interested in. And, you know, if you want to do space, uh, if you want to do something with space when you grow up, then, you know, learn about space, learn about all the different things there are to learn about in space. You know, not that learning about all the things is possible, but, you know, go to museums, read books. Just, I think, keep learning and then be willing to learn new things. And that's the most important thing. Um, there was a second part to this question. Yeah, it, the second part is what were the biggest obstacles that you had in the pursuit of your current career? Um, biggest obstacles, I think. Uh, definitely. Um, so I, I was that student in school who like had her hand up all the time and, um, you know, answered every question and wanted to get like 102 on every exam. And I did that for the most part, but then I got to college and stuff was a whole lot harder. And I started getting like really bad grades in my classes. And one of the hardest things for me to realize was how to limit myself and how much I do. Like I want to do everything, but that doesn't mean I should be doing everything all the time. Um, and if you, actually space yourselves out a little bit, you will get the chance to do everything. Just, you know, maybe three or four different things at a time. So, yeah. Thank you. Kim? Yeah, um, I love her two's answers. And I would just say for me, I, I definitely recommend coding for my career. Coding really was a key that unlocked the universe because 
there are so many different things that we do with coding to help take care of the gender spacecraft and then also to analyze the data and then to produce some sort of science output, if you will. And I learned coding in college. There wasn't really a heavy computer science class when I was in high school and I really wasn't even aware of it if there had been. Um, so I learned coding because I had a work study program to help me fund my um, college program essentially. And my professor that I was working for economics wanted a web page. So I learned HTML and that simple act of creating my first web page, and it was like horribly ugly and tacky. Um, I loved it. I loved being able to create something like that. And so I just took that a step further and learned like a little bit more coding, learned a scripting language, and then went into object-oriented program. And it was for me that idea that I could learn and keep going and keep progressing. Um, but like Rutu said, it's also hard to just pick one thing because when I'm like working with people in a team, when I'm looking to bring someone new into a team, I'm always looking for people that come from very different backgrounds that bring lots of different skill sets to the table. Um, people who speak different languages, people who are curious, people who are creative, artists and former journalists and programmers, yes, but people maybe that were programmers after they did something else, who knows, right? Like I've always really appreciated working with a group of people that are very um, different in their perspectives that they bring. And so I would say for me, my obstacles have been varied, but I would say um, similar to Ritu, once I was in college, I definitely struggled a bit with some of my classes. And I remember being horrified that I failed a class because I was paying for my college, right? And so when I failed a class, genetics, I'll never forget it. I was mortified that all that money down the drain, that time I was embarrassed, but I hadn't gone to my professor for help. I thought I could do it all on my own. I was being very stubborn. And also I was really shy. I still am kind of shy and people don't know that about me. And it was hard to reach out for help. So one of the lessons I learned early on is that that's nonsense. You should always feel comfortable reaching out for help. Definitely do not be embarrassed and it's okay to fail. I can honestly say that that failure taught me so much more than like five classes that I aced, right? So for me, being able to fail really was a helpful part of my journey that kind of steered me in a different direction. And then here I am today doing something that I love. You both talked about um, struggling when you got to college and um, maybe not getting your grades, maybe failing a class, which actually leads to our next audience question. Um, that comes from Gia Leah, if I'm saying that correctly, from the second grade. And they want to know if you make a big mistake and you're in, in what your work is now, how do you fix it? Rita, you want to start? Uh, sure, yeah. So if you make a big, well, here's the thing. First of all, there will be times when you make big mistakes. Everybody does, as Kim said, you know. Failing is okay because everyone does it. You would be really weird if you did not fail at something at some point. And the way to fix it is, you know, first of all, you have to realize that something is wrong. You might figure that out yourself. Somebody else might tell you. And then just, you know, have an open mind like, okay, it's wrong, you know, no need to be defensive. No need to like be like, no, 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 I can't make a mistake because then you can't fix your mistakes if you don't like accept that you've made them. And then just go back and see what was wrong. Um, for example, if it's like a huge mistake with some code, you go through it line by line and go, does it work up to this point? Yes. Does it work up to the next point? Yes. You have to systematically go through and just figure out how to fix it. And then everybody will be like, yay, you fixed it. And everybody will forget that you like didn't have it. Correct, the first time. Um, so yeah, just you know, be willing to say that, oops, I did that wrong, but I'm gonna go fix it now. Yeah, 100%. And I just, my, my cat is trying to make an appearance. So if you see midnight, everybody can say hi. <laughs> always, always when I sit in the chair to talk, he appears. Anyways, um, yeah, I think it's really important to just keep things in perspective because I have always struggled with failing. Like I mentioned, when I failed that class, it was like horrifying to me, not only because of the money, but I was just really embarrassed and just felt so down. And I think what I've tried to learn since then, and I'm not saying I'm totally successful, but what I've tried to learn is that 
you have to keep things in perspective, right? Um, I was not in an operating room, right? When I failed that class, like I was some, doing something that I was trying to learn. And for me, failure since then, even when failure is really hard and I feel like I've done something really bad or just done a really poor job, I just try to keep that perspective of, you know, where is this in the grand scheme of people's lives, right? And that usually gives me some measure of comfort. And then, sorry, from there, it's all about, and my cat agrees. Um, and then from there, it's all about, like Ruchi said, owning up to it for me as quickly as possible and then fixing it because truly, I, I'm not just saying it, but I, I have absolutely learned the best when I have failed at something because that's a lesson you'll never forget. And then when you can successfully fix something that you've done poorly at, the relief and that feeling of happiness is very strong. Again, as my cat agrees. <laughs> Sorry. <Good> night. <laughs> it's very frisky this morning. I don't know what to do about it. Anyways. <laughs> Add one quick thing that I forgot to say, um, but uh, can talk and remind me. So yeah, first of all, yes, it's really hard to accept that you failed at something. Um, my initial reaction was always to just panic and especially in grad school, I used to go into like this sort of, oh my God, nothing's gonna work now. Oh, my, my thesis is a lie. Um, and then you have to like remember to breathe. And also there, there's a balance, you know, accept that you have made mistakes, but have confidence in yourself. Have confidence that your past self probably knew what they were doing to some extent. Because several times when I thought I had failed, once I actually calmed down and went back and looked at my code and looked or looked at other things, I was like, I actually did that properly. And the current me has forgotten why I did that thing. So it, it is a balance. Be willing to accept that you have failed, be willing to fix it, but also don't panic because your past self also knew what they were doing. <laughs> exactly. Um, I just wanted to note, we have received so many amazing questions that we plan to, if you all have time, go over no more than five minutes. Does that work for you both? Oh, yeah, right, absolutely. Right, get into the next great question. Great, perfect. Because you all have some slides for this next question that I, I want to make sure everyone shares. So Kim, we'll start with you. What's a cool project you're working on right now or have finished recently? Yes, definitely. Let me um, share. So I think I was talking about how um, I'm very interested in, oh, you know what, did I... Not sure I selected sound, I think I did, we'll find out. Um, I spent well over 10 years of my career focusing on visuals, creating something that people can see. And it really bothered me that I had left out a segment of the population that could not process that data in the way that I had made it. And especially as someone who's paid by the government where everything I do should be public domain and accessible. Like I really felt a moral and ethical obligation to be able to make sure that what I had was shareable to more people. So during um, the pandemic, we actually started a, a project with some colleagues, um, Matt Russo and Andres Santaguida specifically, to be able to take the information that we had created visuals for and translate it into sound. And I'm just going to play a little snippet here. Hopefully you can hear if I could get a thumbs up. that's taking that same information of an exploded star I showed earlier as a two-dimensional image and as a three-dimensional model, and then taking that information and translating it into sound. So these are not space sounds that you would hear if you were in outer space, because we can't do that. We can't hear in outer space. There's no real medium for information to travel to our eardrums. But here on the ground, we can take information that could be, say, visual in one form and translate it into another form where we can hear. And this was such a fun project to work on. We've done about 12 different of these pieces of data sonification, they're called, or, you know, space soundscapes, I suppose. And the response has been just magical. I, I've been so pleased. We've worked with um, people who are blind or low vision to be able to make sure that we can understand and really make some beautiful meanings out of this information. And then 
just, yeah, we shared them with the world and it became very, very popular. And it was just so gratifying to know that something that I had created for a small tight knit community ended up being useful, not only for them, but for people around the world. And that was a really exciting finding that if you try to make something better for one group, you could help make it better for all the groups or at least more groups. So yep, that's one of the projects that we've been working on lately. Thank you, Ruta. Uh, yes, I will also share my screen. Okay, so hopefully you're seeing this weird looking graph. Uh, yeah, okay, cool. So um, as Kim said, we, she, so she has done a lot of stuff in trying to bring the universe to everybody. And I like to delve a little deeper into bringing very specific aspects of the universe to people uh, of the universe to people who you know don't usually study it. So I want everybody to be able to fall in love with the universe and understand it. Um, maybe not to the depth that people who work in uh, astro do, because that, that 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 takes a while, but in enough depth to be able to appreciate it and see how cool space is and how cool the world and cosmos around us is. So what we have here is actually, um, it's light that has sort of been taken apart, if you will. Um, so when you throw sunlight through a prism, you get a rainbow of colors, right? That's how rainbows form, you know, sunlight goes through rainwater and like water in the atmosphere and forms this like array of colors. And it turns out that if we look at stuff in space and we separate out its light like that, we can tell what things in space are made up of. So what I wanted to do was show people how we learned about that. So what you're seeing here is, this is called the E0102 supernova remnant. It's called that because there are so many things in space that we, we can't name all of them with cool names. Um, <laughs> So it's a, a star exploded and this is what was left over. And we wanna know what's up there. Um, and to do that, we take the light from the star and we separate it out. Again, this is a computer doing this. There is way too much light for me to separate it out on my own. So I, I, I tell a computer, hey, tell me how much red light there is. Tell me how much green and blue, et cetera. And depending on what light is most bright, basically when something is higher, it's brighter. So given that this is a little higher over here in the red, it's saying that and this is a little higher at this point in green, it's like, oh, this is showing us that there's oxygen up there somewhere and neon. Basically, this particular band of red and this particular band of green are very specific to those materials, to those elements. And this is how much light came in when we looked at this thing for about two hours. But we want more details, so we keep looking at it for longer and longer. And you see little, you see like these little tiny bumps, and the computer just tells us, hey, there's more of this kind of blue light, tiny little bump. And that tells us there is silicon up there. Silicon is the stuff that makes up sand. Um, silicon and oxygen make up sand, and that's up there where a star exploded. Um, there is sulfur. Neon is the stuff you see in like light signs, like signs in front of stars. That's up there in the stars. And we can use this to see that like a lot of the things that, like basically everything you see around us, even our own bodies, came from stuff that's in stars. We actually use this to figure out that our bodies are made up of the same exact things that are up there in stars. So I thought that was really cool. And um, I like being able to show that we can spread out the light like this. Yeah, I'm trying to think of a, a, a different word to describe that, but all I can come up with is that's really cool. <laughs> that, <laughs> thank you both for sharing both of your projects. And unfortunately, we are out of time. Um, Thank you all for joining us today. We have so many, uh, we wish we could have got to all the audience questions. We hopefully we can figure out a way to get those questions answered, answered for everyone. 
who are watching. It was so great to hear about Kim and Ruth's experiences. Teachers, please fill out the survey that you're receiving your email tomorrow and be sure to check out the other class chats and the virtual field trips, including a field trip from NASA Chandra X-ray Observatory at code.org slash CS Journeys. They're happening all semester long. Thanks everyone. Thanks Kim and Ruthu. Thanks. Thanks everyone.